How good do you think you are at guessing somebody's age? Would you say I fit into this category? Probably, right? How about here? Still feeling good about it? How about here? Not so sure anymore. What you're noticing is the smaller the range gets, the harder it is to guess. Of course, I'll never tell you how old I really am. In this topic, I'll explain something called a confidence interval, which is a way of helping us to report the certainty in our measurements. Let's start the discussion with this equation right here. Now, just so you know, you won't actually have to work with this equation like for any calculations. I just wanted to show it to you because it already represents something I'm sure you're familiar with. It's this shape right here. This is called the normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution. And yes, some people call it the bell-shaped curve. Now, let's just say that we're taking a bunch of measurements. So, for example, you're trying to guess how old I am. This is the true value, and this represents the spread of everybody's different guess. The way that a Gaussian distribution works is that 68% of all of the guesses of all the replicate values should be plus or minus one standard deviation away from the true value. Two standard deviations at 95%, and we work our way down. Normal distributions work their way in a variety of different examples. So here we see the distribution of men and women according to their height, and you can see that the average for males is a little bit higher than it is for females. Of course, if we pull out a different distribution, so for example, we look at all the baseball players, the pro baseball players in the world, you can see that they're actually a little bit higher than the average male height. Here's another classic example of a normal distribution, flipping a coin. But to do this experiment, what we're gonna do is flip a coin 100 times, and then I'm gonna look at how many times I've got heads versus how many times I have tails. Of course, you know that it should be 50-50, right? But if you do this experiment, you're not gonna always get 50-50. So one time you do this and it actually turns out you got 52 tails and you do it again and you do it again. Every single time you're doing 100 coin tosses and just counting how many times are heads and tails. They'll be different each and every single time. Now this is purely theoretical data, but let's say we do this coin toss where we're increasing the number of flips. Each time the average will always be exactly half of the number of flips, at least the theoretical average, and the standard deviation will be based on how many flips we do. You can see that the standard deviation is getting larger, although the relative standard deviation is actually getting smaller. So the distribution is actually getting tighter and tighter towards the true expected value, the higher the number of tosses. And this is what gets at the heart of a confidence interval. Whenever you're taking replicates, you're probably only taking a few. So the standard deviation will probably be pretty high, and it may not even be a true reflection of the population standard deviation. I'll give you another example right here. So I have a toonie right here, and the goal is to figure out how much it weighs. Here's another guessing game for you. Do you think that this toonie weighs between zero and a thousand grams? A thousand grams being a kilogram. Um, yeah, let's, let's be pretty sure that it's somewhere in between there. What if we tighten the range? Somewhere between 0.1 and 100 grams. Are you sure about that? 100 grams is the mass of about 100 mils of water. So yeah, it's less than that. Now, how about between one and 10? It's getting harder to, to know for sure. So you can look up this data and apparently for a toonie that's been produced since 2012, the average mass will be 6.92 grams. I happened to try that out and see what it came up to. So a toonie on my scale came out to 6.93. So does that mean that this toonie is off? My balance is off? No. Well, it means that the, it just means that there's going to be a certain tolerance to these numbers. The weird thing is that I took it off the scale and waited a second time, and this time it actually weighed a little bit more. Now that's just the uncertainty in the balance. Hey, nice lake, you wanna go for a dip? So I still want to talk about confidence intervals. I just want to go through a realistic example to see where confidence intervals actually make their way into real life data. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these signs before, but what it basically means is that a government agency has determined that this water is no longer safe to swim in. And the reason that we're talking about is because there's an algal bloom. So what is blue-green algae? Well, it's basically just a single cell organism, this little critter over here. The bad thing about it is that it produces a toxin. So this toxin here is actually what does the damage. 
And it's been, de been determined that if the cell count is greater than 40,000 cells per milliliter of that lake water, then we have a problem. It produces the microcystin at a, at a toxic level higher than eight, eight parts per billion, which is a very low level, but still it's enough to do harm. So let's go ahead and actually measure that water. All we're doing here is we're counting how many cells there are in a milliliter of water. And remember the value that we're concerned about is 40,000 cells per mil. From each of these replicates, you can see that we're below 40,000, so it seems like the water is safe to swim in, but not so fast. Keep in mind that these are just experimental measurements. The true value is something that we're looking for, but we don't necessarily know what it is. So we're gonna massage this data in a way and try to report a value that's more reflective of the true value, which we don't actually know. The most obvious thing that we would do is we would calculate the average and the standard deviation. These numbers reflect our guess at what the true value is and a reported value dealing with the precision or the spread in our number. We can report this in a couple of different ways. So visualizing that standard deviation, we could actually reflect the low and the high range in our values. You still see that they're all below 40,000. So according to Health Canada guidelines, everything looks okay. We're below 40,000 cells per mil and that looks all right. However, keep in mind that we've only taken a few measurements. There is a spread. Whenever we do these numbers, we're only taking a sample of the true population. Okay, I know, that's still confusing. So let me give you an, an even simpler example. Let's just flag some people down and ask them a simple question. What's your favorite hockey team? So the first person says, the Maple Leafs. Then I ask somebody else, and I keep asking people, and these are the four responses that I can get. So from the sample of four people, I can determine that about half the people in Canada are Maple Leafs fans. Now, is that true? Is that an accurate reflection of the true sample size? Um, or is it the fact that we just happen to randomly sample four different people? Just because it seems like the average is that we have a high Maple Leaf set of fans, that doesn't mean that's true. The other possibility is that we're living in an alternate universe where nobody knows right from wrong. So the data that we have to date refers to the average and the standard deviation from a limited set of measurements. We've done five. If we could have done this experiment a thousand times or a million times, then the spread might be different. And this is the equation that we use to calculate a confidence interval. From the example that we're working on here, we can see n refers to the number of replicates, s is the standard deviation, x bar is the mean that we've calculated, and this value over here is the true value. It's the value that we don't actually know. We're just trying to get a best estimate of what it might be. Now the last value in the equation is this value t and t is named a critical value. So let's talk a little bit more about what that number actually means. Firstly, you'll find t values in a table that looks like this. So this is in your textbook. And it's listed according to this thing called degrees of freedom. So degrees of freedom simply refers to the number of replicates that you've done minus one. The one comes from taking the average. So in our case here, we had five replicates, which means we have four degrees of freedom. We also see different values corresponding to different confidence intervals. Now 80%, 90, 95, these are almost arbitrary numbers. So if you're not actually given a number, it's really up to you to decide how confident do you want your numbers to be. Normally we would pick the value 95% just because it's a good number. There's no real reason behind it. So we're just going to pick the value 95% and pull out 2.776. That's our critical value. So let's hold on to that number and plug it back into this equation right here. So we've calculated all the other numbers. We have the standard deviation, the mean, and of course the number of replicates. So we can report a value as 38,042 plus or minus a number that's bigger than the standard deviation. So that's what a confidence interval is doing. It's trying to supply a range to your values within an accepted level of certainty. So in this case here, we have 38,000 plus or minus 2000 and if you re re represent these numbers this way you can see that the low and the high value actually crosses above 40,000. So what we're saying here is that at 95% confidence the measurements that we've done seem to be perhaps higher than 40,000. What if we were to pick a different value 80%? Well we're going to use a smaller value for t and we can take that number and plug it into this e the same equation and you'll see here that the range comes out to be smaller. So 
The value 36,000 to 39,000 represents the range of our values with 80% confidence. So how does that work? It means that we've taken a bunch of replicates and we've come up with an average. And the average is right down the middle, okay? So we're gonna take a spread plus or minus on each of those sides. To be 80% sure, we're gonna say that our numbers have to cover a certain range. To be even more sure that the answer is within that range, we spread the range out. So the confidence interval represents how wide of a range we get to be sure that the true value lies somewhere in this range. We don't know where the true value is. It could be anywhere. We've just taken measurements and we're trying to interpret that our values are representing the true value. The larger the spread, the more sure you are that you've captured the true value. So that's what confidence intervals are doing. So coming back to our example of swimming in the lake, We've done a bunch of replicates, and every single time we took a measurement, it was below 40,000 cells per mil. But we don't know what the real value is. So we have an average, we've calculated a range, and that range might still be above 40,000. The true value, we don't know what it is. But if it is above 40, we're in trouble. So with 95% confidence, we can't conclude with absolute certainty, 95% certainty, that that water is safe to swim in.